Hello and welcome to another episode of Some Seminarians. I'm Deacon David Chaco and I'm joined by Luis de la Cruz and Moses Castro. And we're excited to talk to you guys today about a topic that's very dear to our hearts and that's the Eucharist, specifically the Eucharistic devotion and how it's helped our discernment and how it can help anyone's discernment. So um, welcome today, guys, and yeah, it's thanks. good to be here with you. No, I'm excited about this topic, like you said, especially in the midst of the Eucharistic renewal that's taking place across the country, but also here within our archdiocese as well. So I think this is such a timely topic for us to talk about. And it's so intimate to each one of us in our in our journey, um, like you were saying, especially within our discernment journey. Um, and so I, I know for me personally, like it's been a steady aspect of my entire time in discernment and even here, obviously, within the semin in seminary, too. Yeah, and I think um, the Eucharist is the source and summit of our Christian life. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think that's why there's such a powerful connection for all Catholics and the Eucharist. But I think there's a special connection for us as seminarians right. and yeah. studying to be future priests because the Eucharist is going to be the center of, it should be the center of everything we do. Yeah, and it's it's been one of those things that I think at any point in your life, whether you're a priest or any vocation, it helps you discern in a very intimate way because it is Jesus, body, blood, mm -hmm. soul, and divinity. So how better to discern than in the presence of Christ? Amen. I think that yeah. reminds me of one of my favorite reasons that I started falling in love with Eucharistic devotion um, was after reading uh, the autobiography of Archbishop Fulton Sheen. Mm -hmm. um, he's one of my, I think, inspirations yeah. just because he talks so much about the love he had for the Eucharist. And one of the practices he did was to spend time every day, actually a holy hour every day in right. the presence of the Blessed Sacrament. And it just reminds me of the importance. Um, he, he tied it to scripture where Jesus, uh, right after his last supper uh, with the apostles, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane and he experienced his agony. And Fulton Sheen says, Jesus did not ask for an hour of activity but rather an hour of companionship. Wow. Could you not keep watch one hour with me? And so um, just the way he spoke about how, how important that is for us who are discerning the priesthood and God willing in the future to continue that practice as priests, um, that really impacted me. And it's something that I want to keep trying to, to follow throughout my life. Yeah, definitely. The holy hour, I think, is super important. Uh, I had heard a quote attributed to Fulton Sheen that said, uh, the priest who prays a holy hour every day will never leave the priesthood. Wow. Uh, and I, I think it's just that powerful because it's just, it's when you're, I mean, when you're just in a married relationship, mm -hmm. if you don't talk to the person that you're married right. to, uh, I mean, a lot of problems can right. happen. Yeah. Uh, you can, that the person you live with can become a stranger. Mm -hmm. And and I think it's the same thing with, with um, the priest, the seminarian, any lay person, mm -hmm. uh, the times that you don't spend with Jesus, he becomes a stranger to you. Right. Uh, and, and so that's the importance of dialogue and communicating and, and having that communication uh, open. And I, the beautiful thing about the Holy Hour is it paves this, uh, in this disposition for you to dialogue with Jesus. Now, I'll be, I'll be honest. When I was first discerning, you know, I, I, was working a full-time job. I didn't have an opportunity maybe every day to make a holy hour, but mm. I know that the saints all also were just encouraging, make frequent visits to the Blessed right. Sacrament, however yes. long you can. And so whether that was like 10, 15 minutes, um, stopping on my way to work or on my way back from work, but right. I found that to be really peaceful time and a really profound time. And more and more, like sometimes I didn't know, um, you know, I didn't know what to say or how to use that time, but I always felt like left feeling happy, mm -hmm, feeling peaceful, yes. a feeling like, like the Lord is here, and and really that's all that matters. Like right. I'm I'm with the Lord, um, and so that was, that was always like a powerful experience for me to make maybe small qu quick visits, but to just be able to say like, wow, like the Lord has visited me. Like right. I, I feel like I'm yeah. going to Him, but really I'm receiving. <laughs> I'm the one who's receiving. I'm not yeah. really giving that much. I'm not. Right. I'm just receiving. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I want to go back really quickly to the quote that you shared, Luis, about um, the, the priest who doesn't make a holy hour, you know, potentially leaves a priesthood or how, however the quote went exactly. Because it's important even for our lives as seminarians, we do have a liturgical schedule that we do every single day as a community. Mm -hmm. um, morning prayer, the mass, evening prayer, compline, things like that. And even with those and just very much like the life of a priest who lives such a sacramental life, um, it, 
celebrating the mass, reconciliation, anointing of the sick, weddings, all these sacraments that the priest is, is doing, but yet the potential that one might leave the priesthood, right? They need that foundational in, uh, relationship with the Lord. And that's what I heard you say mm -hmm. about creating that relationship with Jesus Christ. Yeah. And so we all need to create that space, like you were sharing, David, like that time away on your own, um, away from work, away from family, away from friends, but with Christ mm. himself. And so that the holy hour or time in front of the Eucharist is not like the the mass or rec um, reconciliation or other sacraments, but it's just this genuine time of being with the one who loves you the most, mm, right? Yes. Jesus Christ. And just being there and allowing him to speak to you in a way um, that like you said it, you left there li leaving joyful um, mm -hmm. and happy and renewed and refreshed. And I think that's one of the things about Eucharistic devotion is giving him space to speak mm. um, and allowing that carving out that time to to spend with him, I think is really important because we can get lost in um, the sacraments, um, which is really beautiful and important. I'm not downplaying that, but like this idea of being before the blessed sacrament yeah. as well and giving, giving time to Christ um, to speak to you in that way. Amen. Amen. And I remember like in my own life, like I'd already started thinking about seminary and I'd already like started the application process, but you know, like I still felt like, you know, some hesitations and, and that's normal. That's fine. But I remember, um, I felt convicted, uh, to start making more visits and, you know, when I could longer visits to the blessed sacrament. So like a full hour if mm -hmm. I could. And, and wow, that like sealed the deal for me on my discernment. Like I started just realizing like every time I was there, I would just fall more in love with Jesus and the Eucharist. It's like, wow, like the love of a God who's mm. here, like it's amazing. And, and it, it was just over overwhelming. And I, and more and more, I was like, I can't see myself not living this life anymore. Like I started more and more feeling less hesitation. Like I really want to enter in seminary because I really feel this pull from God. Wow. So Eucharistic pre pre being in the presence of the blessed sacrament um, really sealed the deal for me and my discernment to yeah. at least enter the seminary. Yeah. yeah. And, and I want to touch on, I guess, just, uh, I guess from my experiences in discernment where I'm at now in my life versus where I was before mm -hmm. I entered the seminary, I would, in the past, I would visit the Eucharist uh, or, or visit the Eucharist. And, sure. and now I think I'm, I'm more frequent in my time and with Jesus and more intentional. Uh, but I would say that those out there who are discerning, not to become discouraged if you hear like, oh, some people are spending every single day. <laughs> I'm not living up to that. Right. No, if we're, we're all in different stages and different uh, roads on our journey. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so the beautiful thing is like God attracts you in a certain way, the way that it's meant for you in your mm -hmm. life. Um, and, and so for you, and, and I think for all of us actually, mm -hmm. Uh, he attracted us to the Eucharist first, right. uh, and that's where I was able to search him. And I think that's why it's, it's, I think it's one of the fastest ways. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and and it doesn't mean that if you're not going uh, to holy adoration uh, every seven times a day for three hours a day that you're, you're right. <laughs> but uh, it, it's this thing of of just you know going when you feel called. Yeah. Um, there's a, a a great quote that I like by uh, Padre Pio. A thousand years of enjoying human glory is not worth even an hour spent sweetly communion with Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. Mm. Wow. Um, and it's just so so many things. I, I feel like you d just being present with Jesus, if, if, even if you don't feel anything, because uh, love is more than just feelings. Mm, right. um, the impact that happens to you in the rest of your daily life is very, very visible, I think. Has, has that been y'all's experience? Absolutely. It bears fruit. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think also, too, what you were saying about, um, you know, people may not be going every single day and we're all on our own journeys. I think yeah. that's incredibly important for us to mention as well. Like each one of us is on a unique journey with Jesus Christ. Right. And he has us in different places and on that journey. Um, I know for me, uh, I don't even know how I started going to adoration, honestly. Like it just it's it happened. And then I started going more frequently and I, I had a desire to go to the uh, Eucharistic chapel. And it wasn't a conscious choice on my point, I don't think. Like, it just was a desire of my heart. Like, I wanted to be near Jesus. And there was a point, I remember, right before entering seminary and even the discernment house, um, I felt like I was wasting a lot of time in the adoration <laughs> chapel. Like, that's where I would go and spend my free time. And I remember thinking, like, man, 
should I be concerned? Like, am I wasting my time here? Like, I know it's beautiful to be before the Blessed Sacrament, but I also know like charity means there's actions and there's works associated with it. Should I be with the poor? Should I be um, helping the uh, CCD class or faith formation class versus being here in the Eucharistic chapel? And so that was a part of my journey. I, I didn't understand exactly what was happening. And, and I really was, I'm wasting, I'm wasting using air quotes there because I didn't feel like it was wasteful, certainly not. But I was like, is this what I'm supposed to be doing? Even though my heart's just drawing me to be before the blessed sacrament in the, in the chapel. And I'll share this. I went, ended up going on a conference to a conference in Dallas. And, um, one of the speakers, a, a Dominican sister of Mary, mother of the Eucharist, I remember her speaking and she was speaking about adoration and Eucharist, Eucharistic adoration. And I just closed my eyes because I was receiving what she was saying. It was very beautiful. And one thing she said that really struck me, and I'm sure many of you have had the same similar experience when you feel the Spirit speaking to you. She just said, you're, my eyes were closed and I heard that she was speaking only to me, right? <laughs> she said, you're seeking love itself. Mm. And when that happened, I, I promise you, there was a gust of wind across my face. And I like opened my eyes to see like, oh, someone walked by or something. No one walked by, but I felt that the, the gust of wind and I heard the word spoken to me, you're seeking love itself. And it was an answer to my, my questioning, like, am I supposed to be doing this or not? Why am I spending so much time here? And in a sense, I want to I wanna joke that it was God like smacking me across the face just a little bit like, hey man, come on, you, you're <laughs> seeking me, you desire me. Like this, it's love, it, I am love itself. Of course, that's why you're coming to me or spending time in the Eucharistic chapel. And so I remember for me, it was like, all right, like that's all I need to do. That's what the Lord's prompting me to do now. That's where he's leading me. So that's how I'm going to respond today. Um, because at that moment, that's what he was calling me to. It's what I feel. And so it was love itself. I mean, that's who's there. That's wow. in the tabernacle, yeah. you know? And so yeah. it answered all my questions. I, I stopped saying them. I'm wasting time. I'm like, <laughs> Lord, this is where you want me. And now I'm here in the seminary. And I, I believe that that was a concrete step along the journey of him calling me. Um, and so, like you said, when you opened, like, as we discern, avail ourselves to a holy hour, to the blessed sacrament, um, as we go about our day and during the week at any opportunities that we have. Uh, but yeah, for me, that was like that one thing, like I'm wasting wow. time here. <laughs> yeah. yeah the, the, thanks. Oh, go ahead. Uh, or yeah, there was two things that I, I, I heard there. There was this great desire there to go visit the Eucharist, to visit Jesus. And just, I mean, the desire is really love, mm -hmm. uh, trying to that longing for love. Right. Uh, and it reminded me of this quote I, I uh, had heard not too long ago from James Finley. Um, Your longing for God is only an echo of his infinite longing for you. Wow. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it wow. hit me very deep. So, so that longing that you feel yeah. is really just God's love drawing you back to him. Right. And that uh, reminds me really quick. Uh, I, yes, know, yes. I know you got one more thing, but that reminds me of a section in the catechism uh, about prayer. Mm -hmm. And it talks about like, it uses the image of the Samaritan woman at the well. And she, yeah. but he said, your, you know, your thirst is just like a, a fraction of God's prior thirst right. for you. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, yes. No, that, I love that. And so that and, reminded me about that that quote from the catechism. That, yeah. 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 Absolutely. And then uh, the other thing was um, mother Teresa, uh, I, I was, I went, I heard this priest giving a homily and he started talking about how Mother Teresa's order would give, uh, one holy hour. I think it was like four mm -hmm. in the morning. They do a holy hour and then they start their work, the missionaries of charity. Uh, but when things got extra busy and, and just really hectic in their life, cause they're, I mean, they're helping the poorest of the poor. Right. Um, she would add a second holy hour. Uh, and so I think it was like a reporter or somebody asked her like, Aren't you just wasting more time? Which is what you were saying. <laughs> yeah. Aren't you just wasting more time? <laughs> uh, like adding this extra holy hour. And uh, she responded with like, we couldn't do the work that we do if we didn't have this extra mm. holy hour, especially when things get like that difficult and that tense. Right. Um, and, 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 and so I, I, I invite you to reflect a little bit on yeah, that in, in, sure. in your future. But uh, yeah, I just thought it was so beautiful. Uh, and, and I've noticed, at least from my personal experience, I can speak of, uh, I, I, in being there with the Eucharist, mm -hmm. uh, when I don't visit the Eucharist, it's, there's this sense of like, uh, in my life, these stress is just 
heightened oh, right. things become unbalanced i feel like i'm being spun out of control <laughs> and then all of a sudden i i just enter the chapel uh and it, it, there's just a sense of like no i am here mm -hmm. it's a there's this quote that you told me that was from the <laughs> cartusians uh do you remember the quote i'm yeah. trying to remember uh the cross stands still while the world is oh. turning yeah and it's beautiful and so it, basically the cross is the stable thing um, while the world is hectic and running around, yeah. the cross is the stable, the only stable ground. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and this idea, we, 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 <laughs> I like we, that. I like we've that. mentioned it like this wasting time because I think then we can look at the culture and what the world's asking us to do. Produce, produce, produce more, yes. more, more. Like don't take a moment of quiet or silence of meditation and prayer. Like keep going. Don't stop make more make more money certainly but like that idea of like be we the invitation there is for us to then be so countercultural. Mm -hmm. then in the way we live as christians and catholics like be counterculture we're not i'm not using the measure stick measuring stick of the world or the culture i'm looking at the gospel wow instead and really yes. like you said i think did you say it <laughs> already or not but like this idea that what what the lord what jesus asked for us you, yeah you yeah, did say instead of one hour activity in his in his hour of his greatest need he Correct. asked not for one hour activity but yes. one hour of companionship one hour. And, and that's what you're saying like the, the culture now is this false belief that your identity is your productivity mm -hmm. but you're so much more than just that mm -hmm. your identity is that you are a child who is loved by god mm -hmm. uh and, and what you're saying like you're seeking love right. so if, if you fall into this false identity the false self mm -hmm. um you 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 enter into this world that's becomes almost like unknown by god right. and then you fall into sin there's this uh thomas merton talked about that person who uh, is living in this world and, and trying to create this a false self he becomes invisible he becomes nothing because he starts falling into sin uh and so sin is really nothing sin is not known by god mm -hmm. um and and so he this he has this beautiful quote and i'm i'm paraphrasing here but it's it's basically like uh because you become unknown in sin sin is to not be known uh that's entirely too much privacy mm to be because you're to be known by god right uh but you, you're not known in that that part of you is not known so you start trying to patch up yourself trying to make this artificial self mm -hmm. uh and and so i think that's what happens especially with people who are trying to discern in, in this day and age in our culture um i think one of my experiences is like okay i need to recreate myself and have my own image that means i have to have a successful job i have to climb up the corporate ladder right. uh, and i have to have all these things to to say that this is who i am mm. but there came a realization that this is not who i am <laughs> this is this is actually the furthest of who yeah. i am god is calling me to be something else mm. um, and it only happened to me while being in the silence uh -huh. and in the yeah. stillness uh to learn who i am because god knows me infinitely more than i know myself wow because even there too i think people are afraid of sitting in silence because that's when they <laughs> hear themselves like that's when they come to yeah, know themselves yeah. all the more it's a confrontation with those things that we don't want to that we don't really want to bring exactly. up to, about ourselves because um because like sometimes they're painful sure. sometimes it's it's hard to like to to have this time to where you really realize that um this is what's inside of me and these are what's driving me this is what my motives are and right but god loves that person god jesus loves you and he wants to um help help you come to know his love for you yeah i'm gonna give a shout out to a, a seminarian larry curtis mm -hmm. said something so profound in one of, my, one of our classes uh he said more healing happens in our listening than in our talking. Mm. And I was like, this struck me so deep. <laughs> it was just like, do you know what you're saying? <laughs> uh, but it, 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 it's really true because, I mean, we try to fill all this noise. But if we just stop to listen mm. and instead of like, just because we talk doesn't mean that uh, all the, we're doing something mm -hmm. uh, and even in our activity. And so one of the things I've been really trying to focus this semester is uh, really stopping myself because I, I i love getting involved in conversations like forcing myself at times to be a little silent you know <laughs> you've seen me uh to be quiet and listen and be okay in the silence <laughs> like be okay and sometimes it's very uncomfortable yeah. if you're a person who loves to talk to just be quiet because you're like 
maybe they're upset because I'm, or maybe they think I'm upset. Uh, but, uh, but being able to live in that tension of silence mm. creates this inner peace. What you're saying actually reminds me of some of my struggles with holy hours. Cause like, uh, I think there's a p- certain part in your discernment. Um, hopefully, it, you, hopefully you all experience it if you're discerning your vocation, where you feel this this rush of like peace and joy and like I love like for me it was like just those holy hours. I loved being there in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament. But then I noticed over time, was it like once I got into seminary of like one semester in or so. I started feeling a little dry mm. and, and I, I'm, I've got this military, you know, family, military, uh, prior service background. And so I'm all about activity, do uh-huh. produce, like you said, <laughs> yeah, produce, yeah, yeah, produce. Yeah, yeah. And we can bring that even into our prayer. So even in the time of the Holy hours, right. like, okay, I need to, you know, get a rosary in. I need to pray certain, I need to get a checklist of things done. Mm-hmm. I need to be active in my prayer and be spiritually strong and do, do something measurable. Right. And I think what was helpful um, for me at that time was encountering some uh, some advice from Father Jacques Philippe in, mm. in some of his books. And he talks about, you know, just <laughs> like you said, wasting time yeah. with God. Like, you know, would you talk, when, when, would you, do you calculate your relationship with a friend that mm-hmm. you really enjoy? Like that you really want to spend time with? Do you, right. do you calculate it? It's like, how much am I going to get out of this? How much work are we putting in? He's like, and, and he's like, um, you know, loving God is not about, meriting a lot or earning a lot it's really about letting god right. love you and i was yes. like wow he's like that's like god loves the love of the little children who who lets him receive like let's let's hit, receive his love mm-hmm. let's them receive his love and right. it was like that was a profound turning point for me it was like wow i need to maybe not focus on being so <laughs> active and measurable but right. just let myself kind of rest and be in God's presence and let him love me. That reminds me of uh, the first letter of John chapter four, verse 10. It says, and this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he has mm-hmm. loved us. Mm-hmm. Man. And, and and so it's it's really what you're saying is it's just like, it's just uh, the, the way I interpret it is the beginning of love is to allow God to love you. Wow. Um, and, and and it's it's very difficult, I think, especially for men, because mm-hmm. we're we're natural initiators. Right. Uh, but how to sit still enough to receive is is something that I think any man struggles, especially somebody who's discerning. I feel like yeah. that what well, that verse you quoted is like yeah. the definition of the Eucharist, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us right. first, Absolutely. and He's there. He's yeah. always there, always present, <laughs> ready to. Re- to, to give himself to us. See, and, and, and the other thing I was listening uh, that I heard from you was about how we try to measure up. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was, um, Thomas Merton talked about how uh, it's important to meditate on the moments where we become disillusioned with ourselves, when we become discouraged mm-hmm. after a fall. Um, because that's when we reveal our ulterior motives. Like when you fall or yeah. something, you're just yeah. like, do you think you're really holier than you are? <laughs> that you, that's yeah. why you, yeah. you, like, you, you realize that you fell and you're like, oh, I, I thought I was holier. Why mm-hmm. did I fall? Right. Um, so like you had these inner me- measurements of mm-hmm. what it is to be loved by God. But but love, God loves you beyond measurements. Mm-hmm. And, and so being able to sit in that and realizing that even though I'm not perfect, um, even though I'm not measuring these things, love goes beyond measurements. Mm-hmm. I, think, I feel like that's a trend in kind of our conversation, yeah. measurements and measuring and quantifying and yeah. all those things. But that the love of God is inexhaustible. I mean, yeah. we, we can't even fathom not measurable. It's not <laughs> measurable. Exactly. <laughs> and so like our, our little human brains mm. can't even fathom that love he has for us and that ocean of mercy even mm. of that, that he has for us. And so I think that's something that, like you were saying, David, about creating the this checklist, if you will, or checking things off the box, like, okay, I'm going to do all these things to achieve holiness or to feel closer to Christ. Um, and then what you said, Luis, we, we receive this, he's, he's there offering it freely. Yeah. Um, but we're the ones who restrict ourselves from it because we put on this whole human aspect of it, these whole productive, like I said already, quantifiable measurements and things like that. And that actually ends up distancing us from him because we're denying it. We're denying his desire to give us gifts because we perceive that they should be or look a certain way yeah. in the way in which the, the world tells us it should look, right? Yeah. And I think that's the biggest thing. And so that's what I'm catching so far about like this idea of like, it's immeasurable, it's it's inexhaustible. And like, 
people like brothers and sisters listening just think about that for a moment like christ's love for us is inexhaustible and it's it's let let that pour over you and sit with that yeah and feel Mm. that love irregardless of who you are where you've been or what you've done like he's offering that free gift and i like the i like to think about a relationship like a relationship of love like you're, it's not calculating, right? It's not yes. calculated and not calculating. And I think about like when you spend time with uh, friends, mm-hmm. someone you, you love or, or, you know, you are the company you keep. Right. So how important right. the holy hour, how important <laughs> the blessed sacrament, because I think about like our friends tend to rub off on each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, like we, we, we rub off on each other and they rub off on us. Mm-hmm. And so how beautiful to think that, you know, that by spending time with Jesus every day before the blessed sacrament, right. Like we're becoming molded more and more into his likeness, definitely by the sacraments. But I think there's just something of this, this just being there, just time spent, you know, like just because uh, the deeper relationship, the more time you spend, the more you start to rub off on each other. Right. (laughs) And and you said something, a a couple of things that are just running through my mind so fast. (laughs) I'm like trying to figure out what to, uh, you said that deeper relationship. There's, there's something I like to say is the deeper the question, the deeper the relationship. Mm. And, and, and so when you're in that uh, moment in, in spending time before Christ, the deeper the relationship, the deeper the questions you start asking yourself, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and so it opens up that it's opportunity. Down to the root. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> to, to to see what God's calling you, uh, whatever direction in life. Right. Um, and then the other thing about just that love, like being around friends and, and things. When when we go to the Eucharist, I think what I, I realized I was having these expectations of like mm. this is what needs to happen. Yeah. <laughs> this is, uh, but I, I came to realize uh, from James Finley, he gave this quote: "You cannot love on your own terms." Because then it's not love. Mm. Uh, mm-hmm. So when you begin to love, you love on love's terms. So being open in the Eucharist to however God is presenting himself right. to you. Because right. um, you might expect him to come a certain, like, I want you to appear in <laughs> all this glory. Uh, and, and I want you to give me an answer right now of what I want. And But that's not the way God works if you look at scripture. Right. He is so subtle. He was so subtle. I mean, that God was present in the son of God mm-hmm. uh, and that the Pharisees who were the, the holiest men of the time mm-hmm. and understood scripture were so close to him that they couldn't even see him. That's how subtle he was in his wow. presence. Yeah. Um, so coming with that expectation of like, um, I want this to happen. I want this to happen. is something that I fell into, but realizing no love uh, loves on its own terms. Right. Well, wow. um, <laughs> Sorry, I, a... it's, it's like, okay, I just need to go and like take, <laughs> unpack everything and just like, just be yeah. <laughs> before the blessed sacrament. Like, yeah. Now we're all super convicted. And, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's good. It's good. It, it reminds us to humble ourselves and just be in the presence right, of the yeah. Lord and let the Lord do the work. Let the Lord be Absolutely. the initiator. Uh, let the Lord be the author of our salvation. Mm-hmm. Let him be the savior. Amen. And so, um, we encourage you, our listeners to Make uh, frequent visits to the Blessed Sacrament a practice in your life. If it's not something that you've done before, start small and build up. And start um, start with this week. Uh, make a visit to Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, uh, at, either at your home parish or uh, uh, wherever you can find a, a Eucharistic chapel. And uh, pray for us as we continue our journey. Help us uh, with your prayers to grow closer to our Lord in the Eucharist. And um, Please be sure to subscribe, comment, ask questions in our in your comments about uh, what other questions you have about the Eucharist and about devotion and discernment. And follow us on our social media. God bless you. Mm-hmm.